Formed in Glasgow, Stone the Crows came to prominence in 1969. Featuring the dynamic, earthy vocal style of Maggie Bell and the outstanding guitar playing of Alex Harvey's brother Leslie, they were signed by Led Zeppelin's manager, Peter Grant. The band produced four albums and were renowned for their powerful blues-based rock performances. I recently met Maggie Bell at the Riverside Studios in West London to look back at her career. Firstly, when did she realise that she had a musical talent? Uh, very young. Uh, I think it was through the Salvation Army. And they didn't sort of uh, push religion down your throat. It was more or less children from a deprived area where I came from. It was all music and it was... Uh, they taught me a lot about music, singing, playing the tambourine. I think that was at the early age and I thought, I like this, I'm good at this. Uh, and what about your first musical influences? Who inspired you to sing? Uh, well, I had an uncle who was in the Merchant Navy and uh, he used to bring back uh, long playing records in those days. Sarah Vaughan, Billy Eckstein, uh, all different kind of people from that era. Now you started off singing in a dance band, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, the Locarno, it was the Locarno circuit. And uh, I think I was 18 then, and it was a 32-piece orchestra. My mother put the, ad the advert was in the paper, and my mother answered the advert. I never thought I would get it, but I did. And basically, uh, that was the beginning of it all. I never looked back, really, after that. Now, how did you first meet guitarist uh, Les Harvey? Well, Alex Harvey, who was Leslie's brother, he had a band, and uh, they used to play in a place called the La Cave in Glasgow. And Alex was the first sort of blues band that I'd ever got up on stage and sung with. He was the first person that ever gave me any money for singing, really. And he said, look, we're a bit rough and ready, this band. We're a bit too old for you to, to sing with us. He said, but my young brother's got a band called the Kinning Park Ramblers. And he set up a meet with me to, to go and play with Leslie, and that's how I got to know the, the, the Harvey family. So how long did it take you to put that first line-up of Stone the Crows together? Uh, I think it was... I hope I get this right. Um, well, we'd already... The only person we didn't have was a drummer, and that's where Colin came in. Colin was living in London. But we'd all played it in a place called the Burns House in Glasgow, in a pub, for about two years. So that was the beginnings of Stone the Crows, like the keyboard player, the bass player, Leslie the guitar player, myself singing. And the other drummer that we had was a Scottish drummer, he never made it to London. Well, it's a big step for a lot of people coming to London, even in those days, huh? I need commitments in Glasgow, whatever. And uh, then uh, through Alex Harvey again, Alex was working in here. There was a guy called Laurie who was playing bass in the hair band with Alex Harvey and Colin Allen was their lodger. Well, they shared an apartment in Kensington. And that's, and Laurie said, oh, um, Alex Harvey's brother, Leslie, has got a band together and they're looking for a drummer and that's how we got to, I hope, I think that's the right story, it's so long ago. But that's how we got together with Colin. And, and Colin's been with me ever since. <laughs> He's one of my oldest friends. We were signed up to Polydor in those days and there's a good bunch of people at Polydor and they said, uh, Go and rehearse, and we were very well rehearsed. Write your own songs, which we did. Colin did a lot of writing. And uh, we all put little input of uh, writing abilities, whatever. And uh, then we went into the studio and we recorded. I mean, we were recording, uh, say, downstairs in a studio in London, and upstairs would be Yes, just starting off their first album. You know, that was all that sort of era of people. And everybody was writing their own songs those days, but we'd never written before that, before Stone the Crows. Now, how did you come across Led Zeppelin's manager, Peter Grant? Well, Leslie got a job. Uh, his cousin played with a group called Cartoon that was going to America, the big American tour. And uh, the guitar player couldn't make it, he fell ill. So uh, Leslie's cousin said, we've got a tour of America. Leslie had never been to America before could you come with Cartoon and play? So that's how Leslie met Mark London, who was the manager of Cartoon. And Mark London was in, in uh, uh, cahoots with Peter Grant along the way for different ventures and stuff. So when Leslie did the tour of Cartoon with Cartoon in America and come back, and Peter Grant and Mark London said, well, um, we'd, li we'd like to get a band together with you. You know, we'd like to put you with somebody. You're a good guitar player. You're a great guitar player. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I've got a band and a girlfriend up in Scotland. That's my band. I'd like to stick with them because I think something's going to happen with them. And they liked Leslie, so that's when they come up to Scotland and seen us a lot. And took us away from the pub. 
Now, apart from giving you the name, Stone the Crows, Grant's input was fairly limited, wasn't it? Well, he was too busy with Led Zeppelin in those days, really. They were just starting off as well. Do you think he knew what to do with you as a band? No. I, oh, yeah, well, the band. I thought you were going to speak to me about my later life. He didn't know what you had me, but he didn't know what to do with me. No, I mean, Mark London was, uh, like, he dealt with the band more than Peter Grant, because Peter Grant was on the road in America all the time with Led Zeppelin. But I suppose Peter's um, name gave us a lot of weight, really. But Mark London did a lot of the work at the beginning with us. Okay. He, wrote, he, he wrote To Sir With Love as well, Mark London. Did he was a songwriter, yeah, and they married Lulu's manager, Marion Massey. So it's all like, uh, <laughs> the plot thickens. <laughs> and how did you get on with Peter? Fine. I mean, I was, I was friends with Peter Grant until, until his death, until he died. Even though I lived in Holland, uh, we kept in touch. Do you think he was one of the, the great managers? I, th I would say so. But at the end of the day, what I liked about Peter Grant was, um, I mean, I've seen lots of videos even in Madison Square Garden where he's run, garden, he's run after a guy. Some guy, you know, has, has done something bad against his band or bands. He didn't like that. He was all for the, the people in the band, really. And that's what I liked about him. I mean, do you think his reputation was slightly overblown, this, this sort of yeah. li larger-than-life character? He was a pussycat, really. I mean, he had two lovely kids. He had a lovely wife. Um, but in that business, when you're dealing especially with Americans, you've got to be hard, you know. It's, uh, really, it's, it's no... Uh, Easy set a ball game, you know. You got to be, you got, you got to tell them what you want. Otherwise, they'll just trample over you. And especially with a band that became so big as Led Zeppelin, he was there to protect the band and their families. Now, your first album, Stone the Crows on Polydor, was released in 1970. You shared vocal duties with Jimmy Dewar. Yes. Now, was that a good relationship? Yes, it was Jimmy. I'd known Jimmy from the Glasgow days, and. Uh, well, he was one of the, the, the founder members of Stone the Crows. And it was a good partnership. He was a great singer. He was a great talent, Jimmy Dewar, who's no longer with us, by the way. He died last year. But uh, it's like all bands. You've heard the story before, I'm sure, many times. You know, you just get... Uh, you think you want to change, you want to move, you want to change musicians to, make, to push the band even further, musically. It's always down to the music, believe me. So how was the album received? I think Stone the Crows' first album, okay, but uh, we were looking forward to making the second album. Because don't forget, this was our first attempt of writing songs. Huh? I think it was one of the best albums we'd ever done. I think the first band was uh, the best band, really. Now, how helpful was John Peel in that, that early period of that first oh, album? He liked us. He just thought we did a lot with John Peel. I mean, more than a lot of bands in those days, you know. We did all live concerts for John Peel. Uh, he even introduced us at a couple of festivals. He, he liked us, and that for us, that was that was a great thing. That was a good thing. But I mean, it just wasn't word of mouth from John Peel about Stone the Cross. We had to go out there. I mean, don't forget we were doing BBC live recordings from the studios with a live audience, and we used to do it very, very well. What makes a good female vocalist? Do you think? I mean, is it the timbre of the voice, the accuracy? What What do you think is, is important in a, in a good girl a woman's vocal? You got it. Well, for me, it's always came from my heart. It doesn't come from here. It's got to come from somewhere down there. And if you're sincere singing a song, it'll come across, and people will feel that. At this point in time, you were playing with quite a few uh, different artists. I mean, you were supporting quite a lot of big names, weren't you? Yeah, Mountain, uh, Joe Cocker, of course. Uh, was it Three Dog Night? We played with a lot of different people, we played with a lot of bands. You even supported The Who? Yes, we did. Yeah. We did The Who. Yeah. I mean, the tragedy of Les Harvey's death by electrocution on stage was such an avoidable accident. I mean, how did it happen? What, what, what was the problem? Well, we hadn't played any music. Uh, Leslie was just telling the audience, which was doctors and nurses, it was their uh, annual uh, concert. And uh, he said to them, uh, bear with us, uh, we're late in starting, but we've got a technical hitch. And that's when it happened. He touched the microphone and the guitar, and that's when it happened. Because we were all waiting at the side, Colin and I and Stevie Thompson, we were waiting at the side to go on stage, but there was something technically wrong. And it was as quick as that, it was as fast as that. Would you say that his death brutally halted the momentum that was driving... Stone yeah, because we'd started it all together. We'd written songs, we'd toured with each other. It was a journey. And all of a sudden, uh, it ceased to happen, and uh, we took a, 
a long look at it all, Colin and I, and the boys said to me, do you want to continue? And I said, well, we started this off, let's do I've got to finish this. Whatever is at the end, we've got to, we've got to continue this. And we started um, looking for guitar players. First of all, we thought it was Peter Green was going to join the band. He came out of hiding. <laughs> and uh, he, um, up to the last day before we did Wheelie Festival, it was the day before Wheelie Festival, he let us down, said he couldn't go on stage and do it. And Steve Howe, who was, and John Anderson was good friends of ours from Yes, uh, socially good friends as well. And Steve stepped in the day before we did the Wheelie Festival. He did a great job. And then, of course, after that, uh, we get Jimmy. Jimmy McCulloch joined the band. Yeah. Now, how highly did you rate um, Les's guitar work? Oh, he, was, he played with Aretha Franklin, you know. Really? Yeah, he played at the London, the Hammersmith Odeon with Aretha Franklin. And the guys from Atlantic, a guy called Phil Carson, he asked Leslie, he said, uh, you're a great guitar player, Leslie, I think you'd be the only person that could back Aretha. Because he knew that he'd worked, Leslie was working with me, you see. And uh, he knew that we'd done all that Aretha stuff when we were working in the, the, the American bases in Germany. And Leslie got the gig and I went to see him, he was playing Aretha. I, took, I was babysitting Aretha's kids up in Hampstead while Leslie was playing on stage. Well, who do you think Leslie's influences were for his guitar playing? Oh, from Big Bill Brunsey to... Uh, he loved... Um, he respected uh, Pete Townsend a lot. He said he was very underrated as a guitar player. Right. Uh, Django Reinhardt, uh, Steve, uh, Eddie Cochran. I mean, it's a wide, wide variety of people. Right, so you, you decided obviously to continue. Um, and for the next album, Continuous Performance, um, you recruited Jimmy McCulloch from Thunder, Thunderclap Newman. Yes. Who later went on to join Paul McCartney's Wings. Yes. Um, what did you think of his input to the band? Well, Jimmy came to, towards the end of that album. We'd already, we'd all, almost finished that album before Leslie died. We'd almost finished it. And Colin wrote a song for Leslie that, was, that finished the album. It's called Sunset Cowboy, and Jimmy played in that, that track. But um, oh, Jimmy was good. He was great, uh, but. It still wasn't Leslie, do you know what I'm saying? It, it was a situation really where he was very a very hard act to follow, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Abs that's exactly what it was. That's what exactly what it was. At what point did you realise that Stone the Crows had gone as far as it could? Well, the, the, the thrill had gone, really. You know, like like writing songs and musically, it just it just wasn't the same as what it was. And we did try our best after Leslie died. We did try our best, and we decided all just to you know. We'd had enough, really. I wanted a break. And I went to a little island called Gozo, in Malta, uh, with some friends, and I just chilled out there for about six months and just, you know, uh, got myself together, really. And uh, I came back, and Peter Grant said, well, do you still want to continue singing? And he's like a father figure. I said, of course I do. He says, well, we're going to make a solo album. What do you think about that? And that's how Queen of the Night and after that, Suicide Sal come along. Now, you worked with Atlantic's record producer, Jerry Wexler, for yes. the 74 album, Queen yes. of the Night. Uh, you, you must be really proud of that album. Oh, fabulous. I mean, the musicians is uh, incredible. I mean, Sammy Kahn's son, Steve Kahn, but with a K, his son played guitar in that album. Cornel Dupree played in the album. Les Paul from the Les Paul guitar, Gene Paul, he produced that album, engineered the album, should say. So it was a great, great time in my life. It was wonderful. And you sounded in particularly good voice on that album as well. Well, with those people, I mean, you just Jerry said, just go and do your homework. And I'd go into Atlantic Studios in New York and just go in and just... Most of those songs were done in first take. That's, and honest to God, most of the songs were done in first take. That's strange, because I was going to say, do you think you had more time working on your vocals after Stone the Cries? But it, obviously it was the reverse. No, do you know what it took me back to? It reminded me of, like, we were speaking about, I worked with a 32-piece orchestra in Glasgow. Uh, it's like I've worked with um, uh, the, the London Philharmonic Orchestra. I did the Tommy album at uh, the Albert Hall. When you go in there and you play, there's such power behind you. All you've got to do is just sing your heart out. Yeah, and do you think you had more, you know, a lot of confidence at that point? I mean, do you think you were on top of the game at that point? Well, I thought, I must, I must be a, a, an OK singer if Cherry Wexler wants to produce me. I mean, <laughs> let's exactly. face it. I mean, it sold very well, didn't it? Yes, it did. Yeah. I think it went to uh, number 11 in the charts in America. Yeah. Why do you think you, you, you just quite just, just slightly missed out on, on, on you know, big success in America? I mean, did that disappoint you, the fact that it didn't just quite... No, you... no. 
you were happy with what it achieved? Yeah, I couldn't. And even today, even people, people like Katie Malou, the girl, she said the other day in television, breakfast television, it's hard to crack America. It's very, very hard to crack America. And very, very few British people crack America. Americans crack America. But very few British people. Suicide Sal was another of your solo albums. Were you disappointed that it didn't receive much exposure? No, not really. It's, again, it's a progression. That was made in, uh, in Tittenhurst Park. That's where it was made in the, the studio where Lennon and Yoko did the White Album. Same place. It was a great album with great musicians. I'm proud of that album as well. The two solo albums I'm very proud of. Even all, In fact, every Stone the Crows album I'm very proud of. Everything that I've done. Now, you've also written music for TV and film. Was the music for the TV series Hazel, you think, probably the, the highlight? Well, that was with Andy Mackay from Rox Roxy Music. Um, no, Andy said, um, do you want to work with me in this song? It's by uh, a football, ex-football player. What was it? Excuse Terry, me. Terry Venables. Terry Venables, that's it. They're making a, a thing with Nicholas Ball called Hazel. He's a private detective. And I was friendly with Andy and his wife, so we got together and we did the song Hazel, which is just out in DVD, I heard from somebody. Right. Uh, but... Um, didn't care too much for the song. Really, it wasn't me. But then you get the Taggart song was a different story. That was written by Mike Moran and myself. We collaborated with that. And that's been going for 23 years, Taggart. And it's a great song. It's called No Mean City. And Mike said, I couldn't get anybody else to sing the song about Scotland, about Glasgow. They knew Maggie and it, and it worked. It must be great still to hear a piece of your work. Still oh, yeah. You know, extensively. Some TV gold and all that. It's, I think I've been to 136 countries in the world. Yeah, it's amazing. Something to be really proud of, isn't it? Yeah, really? absolutely, yeah. Um, a few, few people know you're an actress as well. Well, I've done a bit. Dabbled a bit. <laughs> so what is it you've But done? I told them I wasn't an actress before they, off the, the, before they offered me the part. I said, I'm a singer, not an actress. And it was Peter McDougall, he's written some, he's a good playwright from Scotland. And he's a friend, and he says, I want you to play Billy Connolly's wife. And that's how it happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I did another uh, Peter McDougal play, where I worked with Harvey Keitel, was one of my heroes, you know, a great actor. And it was about the Polaris base, about what happened there. And I was working in the Polaris base, so I knew all those areas where we were filming for that, down by the Buffalo Room, it was called. And I actually played in those places. And I went back to that place 30 years later. I played with with the Kinnan Park Rambles with Leslie's band and my first band and I went back and recorded that thing where Harvey Cartel walked into the club and I'd played there before. That was bizarre, that was strange. So, I mean, at the point that you were doing a bit of acting, were you, were you thinking, yeah, I think I'll have a... I'll no, I'll never. Have a, no, no, you never, never no, thought, no, 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 this is a different no, road no, I want no, to take? No, no, no. So it was always a secondary yeah. career. But it's amazing the people you meet when you do something like that. I mean, I, I, they said, oh, you've sung um, the song for a target, would you like a part in it? And I played a woman called uh, Euphemia McKenzie, who read Crystal Balls, and the two young boys that come up to Loch Lomond to beat me up was John Hanna from Four Weddings and a Funeral. And meeting, meeting all these different people that I worked with, it was, it was, it was a bonus, it was incredible. But never ever an actress. <laughs> it's the same, but always a bridesmaid, never the bride. No, I, I could never ever. Nervous as hell with that. But I could sing in fr front of thousands, it wouldn't bother me. I wouldn't bat an eyelid. But it's nice to achieve what you have done in acting. Well. It's great. Now, your hit with B.A. Robertson was a cover of the old PJ Proby hit, Hold Me. Um, now, whose idea was it to record that? And were you a friend B. A. of. B.A. Robertson's. All right. And were you an actual friend of B.A. Robertson's? When well, he came to my house, uh, in Barnes many years ago and he was doing a documentary about Alex Harvey and we got on really well together him and I and he said about three weeks later he says I've got a song I think you and I could do and it was a number 10 in the charts and Paul Jones played the harmonica on it it's when it happens it was uh, bizarre but <laughs> did you enjoy it yeah yeah why not yeah different so what type of audiences come to see Maggie Bell these days well, there's a lot of baby boomers <laughs> but they're bringing their kids. So now we've got a different, we've got a new audience. Like people come up to the end of uh, Colin and I, our band, the British Blues Quintet, they come up and say, where, where were you people? Where did you come from? You know, how, how do you sing like that? And young musicians up and coming. 
and that's wonderful for us, it's great. I mean, we did Edinburgh Festival a couple of weeks ago and it went down a storm. We've been to Italy, uh, so we're just starting off with this band and enjoying every minute of it. Well, let's put it this way, 30 years on, there's still people coming out to see me, I can fill a hall. I must have done something right. And finally, what other projects have you got lined up for the future? Uh, with the band BBQ, we're going to record, we have to record because I haven't recorded anything yet. And uh, go on from there really, from strength to strength. Well, it's been great talking to you, thanks very Thank much. you very you. much, thanks. Before joining Stone the Crows, drummer Colin Allen had worked with Zoot Money and the legendary John Mayles Bluesbreakers. Colin had been pleased to get the chance to work with John Mayle. Well, I mean, one of the big attractions was he was going to America. You know, I was dying to go there, you see. So, um, yeah, it, w it was fun. I, uh, and you see, the thing that most people don't know about John's band is he never rehearsed. He never, I, when he called me up, I, I'd been uh, in, in, in Stockholm with, uh, with Georgie Fame, where I met my now wife. Um, and um, and I kept get back and there's a phone call and, a, and you know John John was always big on like recording bands when they didn't realise it kind of thing and um, he said I'll be listening to some tapes you I think you could be good in, in my band I said I said yeah that would be I I'd, I'd like that John and, he, and I, I said uh, when do we rehearse he said oh we don't rehearse <laughs> and that was basically I mean. One of the first gigs, I think it was a Reading Festival, he, he shouted across to Mick Taylor, Oh Mick, start something up, uh, a shuffle in E or something like that. And that was uh, the way it was with John. Which was great actually, because he just, you know, one of the great pleasures of course of playing with John is he never told you what to play, he just played. Which is wonderful. What were the sessions like for the male album Blues from Laurel Canyon? What do you remember about recording that album? Well, it was recorded in three days and mixed on the fourth. That, that was it. I, 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 I mean, uh, prior to work with doing that album with John, which is the first thing I did with John, I didn't play with him before we did the album, I was, um, I was playing the Stockton Fiesta Club with Paul Jones. Uh, Chris Spedding was on guitar, one or two other people, and, um, and I remember that I thought, oh God, I'm going to be playing with John next week. So I used to, <laughs> I used to put my drums in the, in the dressing room and practice playing shuffles, you know. But um, yeah, that, that's well. I came down, I had, the, I had the Monday off, I think, and Tuesday we went into the um, studios at West Hampstead and three days, fourth day, mixed and out. You know, as you were playing with the teenage Mick Taylor, I mean, how impressed were you with his playing? I, it's just, you know, I, I was never a blues fan in terms of like buying blues records, so I, I really, um, I was, uh, you know, coming from a jazz background, playing with Zoo, I was really into soul music and Otis and James Brown and those kind of things, so I really hadn't thought too much about that style of, of guitar playing, you know, but obviously, yeah, I mean, he, he, was, he was great and he still to this day remains my friend and I did a gig with him about a year and a half ago in, in, uh, in, um, in, in Belgium, a festival, because I see him when he comes to Stockholm. I always go down and say hi, you know. So how did you become part of Stone the Crows? Uh, I just finished with, um, with, with Mail, and of course I come back, okay, now what am I going to do now, blah, blah, blah. And um, I knew Alex Harvey, as most people did, and, um, and he mentioned me to Leslie Harvey. And uh, I get a call from Mark London, who was the, uh, became the manager of the band, and uh, went over and met them, and uh, sure, yeah, that'd be interesting. So off I scoot in my Mini Cooper S to Glasgow, <laughs> shitting bricks because I was so worried of all the things I'd heard, you know, don't go on Sucky Hall Street and all that stuff. So yeah, that's what I did. I went to Glasgow and, um, and, uh, and met up with them there and uh, that, was, that was it. Now what is it you enjoy about playing with Maggie? Well, she's so much fun to work with. I mean, I'm realising that now with the British Blues Quintet because, I mean, she's got great rapport with the audience. She's always up for a laugh. She's got a great sense of humour. And, and apart from her singing, which, I mean, you just don't have to really worry about it. She sings and that's what she does, you know. It's the same with, with, the, with everybody in the band. They just do their thing, you know. But, um, now we've been friends for a long, long time. We, we, we've got a lot of memories and... Um, and, and, and to be back playing with her again, probably in the last band I'll ever be in. <laughs> um, no, she's just a great lady to be with. She's a great singer, you know, what more can you say? I mean, how do you rate her as a vocalist? 
oh, she's obviously one of the greatest, like, you know, blues artists or blues singers or whatever. But no, she can sing anything. This is the whole thing. She can sing traditional old Scottish songs and then go into, like, you know, <laughs> blues stuff. And, and, and so she can... Because of the, the what she's come through, you know, seeing with the dance bands and all that stuff, she's not just a, you know, she's she's done all the stuff that people like Ella Fitzgerald would have sung, and she's she just knows all these different types of music, as do I, because I came through all different kinds of music, you know. Now, do you think that first lineup of Stone the Crows is probably the the best musically? It's funny you say that now because I've seen videos of that band playing and I enjoy that music more than the second band. It, it was more, well, I mean most people would term Son and Crows as a, a progressive rock band, which I suppose we were because uh, in that day, though those days it was kind of, you know, oh, let's do something in an odd time signature and oh Jesus Christ, you know. But we, yeah, we did those kind of things. Um, uh, after John and Jimmy were, uh, left the band, um, it became uh, not so different in some respects. It became just more like a rock rock band, uh, really. Um, no, that first band, they, we definitely played some interesting stuff, you know. What, what were your memories of, of the manager, Peter Grant? What were your memories? Oh, well, Big Peter, what can you say? I mean, you're a pretty imposing kind of guy, you know. Um, but as I say, we didn't really have too much to do with Peter because Mark was really our, our manager as such um, Peter just was involved in helping you know obviously for like helping sort out record deals and uh, and, and touring especially in America because we, we went there a couple of times but um, no, a lovely guy Peter you know one of rock and roll's great figures I suppose you would say and how did the sessions go for that first album Stone the Crows it's a long long time ago but did you have a clear idea of what you wanted to achieve nah not really I, I, I mean you know I mean Leslie God bless him was, was uh, a, a really important uh, person in the band in terms of the direction I think um, yeah you know you just go in because you see that was our first what, the first time that I mean that's when I started writing lyrics for songs was in that band and um, uh, you, you, just, you just pitch in and do what you think you can, I suppose. Um, no, I guess Leslie was more, um, had more of a, an idea about, I mean, you know, I'm just a drummer, I hit the pots and pans and that's it. <laughs> you know, but um, no, as far as how they went, I suppose we, we got the record out, so I suppose it went all right, you know. You were an incredibly busy touring band, weren't you, at that time? Yeah, yeah, well, yes, we were, we, we, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a shame, we never really captured on record what we could do in terms of, uh, of, of playing live. We, we, I don't think we sold huge amounts of records, we did sell a lot of records, and we, we always had great attendances wherever we played. The people always enjoyed and would come and see us time and time again. I mean, even, I mean, even now people come up, can you sign this album, and, you know, yeah. yeah. Do you think Stone the Crows ever recovered from the death of, of Les Harvey? Nah, not really. I mean, we went on for a further year, um, but uh, no, Leslie was a very important part of that. I mean, you know, after a, you know, a couple of months, you just have to get on with it, you know. I mean, I can, rem I can remember, you know, like coming back from, from Swansea the next morning, I was going like, not the fact that, you know, Leslie's dead, it was, mm, what's going to happen to me now? It's kind of strange, you know, that, 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 that but, but, but that's it, you know, it, being a muso is a pretty dodgy way of going about things anyway. So, so um, no, I, I honestly don't, uh, in, in many respects, no. Um, well, you know, we did some albums and we still carried on playing and things were going okay, but, but uh, no, Leslie was a very important part of that band. Uh, we recovered, but um, something was missing. Well, what made him a great guitarist, do you think? Probably the fact that it was Alex Harvey's brother. Um, you know, if you've got somebody in the family 
who, who, who's a good musician and uh, as, as Alex was, um, you know, it's going to rub off on you, you know. I mean, I was listening to rhythms because my sister was playing uh, Paul Anker's Little Darling or whatever, then, you know. He, he, you know, you become involved in music through different ways, but I, I think uh, if somebody in the family is playing music, I've always been incredibly jealous of any musician whose parents were, were, were musicians, you know, because they were, they probably started playing and being interested earlier, which is always a good point. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a whole nother thing if, if you've got people in the family involved. Now, if, if Peter Green had joined the race, ah. <laughs> do, do you think that possibly that would have taken the band on another step? Oh yeah, I mean, Peter had such a great reputation then. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't, uh, he didn't have all the oars in the water, as it were. He was still playing great though at the rehearsals, I thought. And because, you know, I was seeing things in this incredibly like, fabulous old oh, Leslie's dead but this would be the rebirth of Peter Green you know it was that that's how I was thinking of it but um, yeah it probably would have been but he I mean he said at the time he said no I can't continue because I think this band's really going to go on and do something and, and he, he just wasn't ready for that kind of thing I mean I, I've played with Peter recently he now lives in the south of, south of Sweden would you believe he lives in yeah and all he wants to do is go fishing you know, so I, I've worked with Peter about two or three times over the last couple of years, you know, but I mean, he, lovely guy, um, but because of his problems, uh, you know, it does affect him some, in some ways, you know. So you settled, you settled on Jimmy McCulloch? Yeah, replacement. yeah, what partially you because he's Scottish, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what did you think of his input to the band? Oh, he was great, Jimmy. I mean, you know, he, a lot of energy, good fun, fun guy, you know, but... Um, yeah, I, I mean, he and I wrote, uh, uh, during we, the time of the album, we, we wrote the song called Medicine Jar, which eventually Paul McCartney recorded. So, you know, I made a few bob out of that, and then I slung him some more lyrics, and that was another song. Um, no, Jimmy, Jimmy was great, you know. He, that, that, you see, there really wasn't a leader in... in t I mean, Leslie, it was never Leslie... I'm the leader. He was just was because of his personality and his ideas about about music probably because of his close tie to Maggie you know that kind of thing so uh, it all came down to him being like the the leader in some respects but uh, no Jimmy was great he was a good guitar player. Now what, at what point did you realise that Stone the Crows had gone as far as it could? Well it, it, it was never it wasn't like that in actual fact we were still going but there were certain like tensions in the band and and uh, I think uh, Ronnie Lee went into <laughs> to to uh, to Peter Grant or I think with Peter was kind of like I don't know complaining about something and, and that more or less Peter said bollocks to you <laughs> now he can go solo which I suppose is uh, quite often the case you know with someone who's such a good singer you know the old management boys are thinking ahead of you know what I mean. Yeah. Now what is it you still enjoy about performing today? <laughs> the fact that I, at my advanced years I can. <laughs> um, you know, once a musician, always a musician. For me, going from working in a bloody aircraft factory, although of course when I started doing it I thought it was great, all oh, making jet aeroplanes fabulous, sitting in the buggers while they rev them up on the runway, you know. Um, just being able to 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 leave that ordinary kind of life and 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 be a musician, uh, not having to go to the office, you know. I mean, you know, being a musician is a tough life in many ways, but 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 just being able to just uh, express yourself, be involved in some form of creativity, um, all the travelling, even though that can be a pain in the ass, it's great. You're going somewhere new. Even if you've been there before, anything could happen on the way, <laughs> Inclu including a car crash, of course. Um, no, I just, um, musicians, you know, the real ones, they, they don't really want to ever stop, I don't think. And do, you, do you look back at the Stone the Crows period as a, as a you know, a favourite part of your career? As in, as oh, fondest? sure. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. Uh, every band is special. I mean, I've had fun with loads of, I, I mean, I'm having fun now. You know, if you're, if you're playing music you enjoy playing, and if you're playing with people you enjoy being with, it's just endless pleasure, really, in many respects. Even, of course, there's always the downside, but we've been doing it. It comes with the territory. 
you know, really all you're concerned with is going on and playing. It's, and it's not for the applause, it's just for the fact that you love doing it, you know, because sometimes people won't applaud, but actually these days that's not the case, you know. And finally, Colin, what other projects have you got lined up for the future? Well, be, I mean, trying to stay alive, I suppose. <laughs> Um, well, no, as I say, you know, we've got the British Blues Quintet, which we're all really happy with. And, uh, and um, you know, we're, we're working, we're going out and doing gigs and um, we'll basically see where it goes. But we, we, don't, we have no problems in terms of uh, the people coming to see us and with the reception we get, because it really is a good band. Um, the, the only downside is that we don't play enough. You know, it's like every time we go, like, like we're going to be doing a gig on this coming uh, Thursday, we haven't played together for about six weeks, you see. So I, I say, <laughs> that's the rehearsal, the first gig. But we know, we, but we basically know the material, but um, uh, it, it, it's one of those bands that, I mean, we don't spend a lot of time rehearsing. We're, we're all done it enough to know to make the best of whatever happens after the count one, two, three, four. <laughs> you know, so no, it, it's going to be good. That's and I'm enjoying doing it. That's great. Well, thanks. That's pretty much Colin. Nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you.